The discovery of the remains of the Stoa of Philip V was quite accidental. By the end of our second season of excavation at Bilizora, we had uncovered, examined, analyzed, and understood the history of the construction, destruction, and reuse of the propylon. All this we outlined in Chapter 3 of this video series. But what did and still does perplex us about the propylon is this. What did the propylon open on to? After all, when a monumental gateway is built, we would expect it to open onto or provide a vista of something important, like a temple, we had hoped. And throughout our excavations in Sector 3, we had discovered several stones that came from a Doric Order building. These stones were either reused in later structures, or were simply found in topsoil. They fed a hope that we could expect, perhaps, a temple nearby. In our effort to identify the focus of the propylon, we drew a line to the south, continuing the axis of the ramp and rectangular room of the propylon. We then dug trial trenches along this line. Immediately outside the rectangular room, we unearthed a large packed pebble road or plaza. But this digging of trial trenches was proving unproductive. So in 2010, we got a bulldozer to continue the line across the center of the Acropolis. Since we knew the depth of the modern topsoil churned over and over by modern plows, we had the bulldozer dig down through this topsoil level. The rest would be dug by hand. But as the bulldozer progressed from Sector 3 toward Sector 6, not only did the packed pebble surface give out, but so too did all traces of ancient artifacts. We were uncovering nothing but modern debris and an occasional ancient roof tile fragment or potsherd. In fact, not far beneath the topsoil was virgin soil. It seems that there was a large open area in the central part of the western Acropolis. But as our trench approached Sector 6, we discovered a pile of 17 stones that obviously came from a building of the Dora Quarter. A TFAHR archaeologist, Kyle Egerer, was responsible for organizing a team that measured and drew these stones. Egerer produced articles that appeared in the TFAHR annual report of 2010 and are reprinted in Volumes 1 and 3 of the TFAHR Bilizora publication. Egra concluded that these stones probably did not come from a temple, but rather from a stoa or a portico or a colonnade. His conclusion still stands, and our subsequent research suggested a date for this stoa, to the reign of the Macedonian king Philip V. So what exactly was it that led us to conclude, first, that the building was a stoa, and second, that it should be dated to the time of Philip V? Let's deal with the identification of the building as a stoa first. Among the 17 Doric Order stones uncovered in Sector 6, we have nearly all the stones of a classical Doric Order entablature, from column drums, to the capital, to the architrave, to the triglyph and metope frieze, to the Geisen block, plus a few anti-capitals. We were missing only two stones, a possible Sema block and the bottom of the column. But the one stone that proved to us that our building was a stoa was this one, S6M22.S16. It is not the base of a Dora column. The traditional classical Dora order column has no base. This piece is part of a column that is typically found in a stoa of the Hellenistic era. The architects of the Hellenistic era introduced an important innovation in the architecture of the stoa, the faceted column. More precisely, they introduced a faceted lower part to a fluted column. Let's look at the reconstructed stoa of Attalus in Athens, which was built much later than the Bilizora stoa of Philip V. Although many aesthetic reasons have been proffered for the faceting of the lower part of a fluted column, the most probable reason for doing so is very practical. The lower part of a column naturally will be exposed to more human traffic than the upper part. By faceting the lower part, you significantly reduce the potential damage to both passing humans and the column itself, particularly the thin arises of a fluted Doric column. The use of such a fluted, faceted column makes great sense, then, in such structures as colonnades, porticos, and stoas, which see a lot of human traffic. Such a column type will, in fact, become standard in the stoas of the later Hellenistic and Roman eras, like the stoa of Attalus in Athens. Notice carefully the column shaft immediately above the fully faceted column shaft. It is fluted, but at the very bottom of the shaft there is a band of faceta. Why? probably so it could be easily aligned with the fully faceted shaft immediately below it. 
It is this second to the bottom shaft that we have in S6 M22 point S16 at Villazora. In our article on Philip V Stoa in Volume 3 of the Bilizora publication, we trace in great detail the appearance of the fluted faceted column in the Aegean world from the mid to late 3rd century BC. We also presented a detailed account of Philip V's prodigious building activities both in and outside of Macedonia, particularly highlighting his Stoa construction. It seems quite likely that whatever architects Philip hired for his building activities, they certainly had enough of a cosmopolitan architectural experience to utilize this cutting-edge innovation in Stoa architecture. We know they used it in Philip Stoa's on Delos and at Megalopolis, and now we know they utilized it again here at Villa Zora. So, we dated the Stoa to the reign of Philip V for the following reasons. First, to attribute the Stoa to an earlier 3rd century BC, either Macedonian or Paeonian king, would place the invention of the fluted faceted column earlier than his first appearance in the Delos, Delphi, or Lindus Stoas in the mid and late 3rd century BC. And it would locate the first appearance of this revolutionary architectural in invention not in the cosmopolitan Mediterranean world of Rhodes, Delphi, or Delos, but in Bilizora, in Paeonia, on the far frontiers of the Hellenic world, which is hardly likely. Second, from Polybius we know that Philip V conquered and fortified Bilizora in 217 BC. Any building program he undertook at Bilizora had to have started, obviously, after 217 BC. Philip's priority certainly would have been the palace garrison and the fortifications of the city. Any civic embellishments, like a stoa, most likely would have come somewhat later. Therefore, we propose that the Bilizora Stoa was built sometime between Philip's Stoa on Delos, which was started between 212 and 210 BC, and the Stoa at Megalopolis, which was built in 183 BC. The fluted faceted column was certainly utilized by Philip's architects in the Stoas at Delos and Megalopolis, so why not at Bilizora as well? It might be possible that the Stoa was built during the reign of Philip's son Perseus, who also controlled Bilizora, as we know from Livy. And while we're certain that the nearby palace was started by Philip V, and continued to be worked on during the reign of Perseus, it was never completed before it was destroyed after the Battle of Pydna in 168 BC. But given the circumstances of the war with Rome, it seems to us unlikely that Perseus would have had the time or inclination to start a new Stoa project. To complete his father's Stoa, maybe, but not to start a new one on his own. These are the stones we found from the Stoa. Of course, we can't be sure that these were the exact locations of the stones. This is just a general schematic diagram of where they may have been located in Philip's Stoa. We did not find much of the Stoa's stairs and platform, which were robbed away after the abandonment of Villa Zora. Only the southeast corner and the subterranean foundation courses remain. From our excavations, it does not seem that the Stoa had an internal colonnade, and the Stoa utilized the city wall as its rear wall, much like the Stoa of the Athenians at Delphi utilized the retaining wall of the Temple of Apollo as its rear wall. As we point out in our article, there could have been a number of ways to roof the stoa. One thing that we realized almost immediately when we discovered the stones was that they didn't end up in this pile as a result of the stoa simply collapsing. We noticed that almost all of the longer stones had been chopped up and then all the stones were heaped up together. Why? The answer is they were going to be burned down into lime mortar. Danny Macquarie analyzed the soil from around the Doric order stones. His article appears in Volume 1 of the TFAHR Bilizora publication. He concluded that the fragments of compact white material found in the soil were consistent with lime mortar or lime plaster manufactured from the burning of limestone blocks. Amongst the Doric order stones, we found this stone, S6 M22 point S18. It is very poorly preserved, cracked and crazed due to extensive exposure to fire in an attempt to reduce it to lime mortar. But for whatever reason, the burning process was stopped before it and the 17 Doric order stones could be reduced to powder. But enough of this stone remains that we are able to identify it as a Corinthian capital in the rough cut stage for the adjacent palace of Philip V. We'll have more to say about this in a later video.